Good Sunday morning and welcome to another edition of At Issue. I'm Corey Smith. And I'm Sue O'Connell. In just a minute, Boston Mayor Michelle Wu will join us to talk about a number of issues, including the migrant crisis, her fight for a free MBTA, and that new pilot program that lets Boston public school students visit multiple museums for free. Before that, it's been a lot of crazy news over the last seven <laughs> days. Here's what was at issue over the past week. A federal appeals court panel ruled former President Donald Trump is not immune from prosecution related to his efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has been spared from impeachment by a single vote. Governor Maura Healey is facing criticism for her choice to fill a seat on the state Supreme Judicial Court. Today, she nominated Gabrielle Wolohogian. She's a state appellate judge and also the governor's former romantic partner. I don't want the fact that she had a personal relationship with me to deprive the Commonwealth of a person who's most qualified for the position. So the special counsel's report into the president's handling of classified documents concludes that no criminal charges will be filed. The report also referenced his age and memory issues. I've seen the headlines since the report was released about my willful retention of documents. This, these assertions are not only misleading, they're just plain wrong. All right, a lot to get to today, so let's go ahead and get started. With the ongoing failure of Congress to address the migrant crisis, the city of Boston is doing its part to help families who have arrived here. Now, right now, dozens of families are staying at the Melnia Cass Recreational Complex in Roxbury, a temporary shelter that the Healy administration selected for use. Now, the rec center is almost full, so last week, city officials notified the Fort Point neighborhood that the state was considering building there as a temporary shelter. And joining to talk with us about this and much more is Boston Mayor Michelle Wu. Thank you so much for joining us. Nice to see you both. Before we talk about the Roxbury shelter, I want you to take a listen to what Ed Flynn had to say about potentially housing migrants in Fort Point. We just are not able to sustain everyone that wants to come here. The situation we have now uh, just can't continue, and we have to make some major and dramatic decisions over the next several months. Mayor Wu, is, is Boston full? You know, cities around the country States everywhere are having the same conversations. We are experiencing in some ways just the symptoms of a federal immigration system that's been broken and that at the federal level there have been now over a decade of conversations about how to fix, but as those conversations are ongoing about how to ensure their legal pathways to citizenship and then to have enforcement and security at the border around legal pathways and then to have resources directed down to municipalities, it is, it's a lot before anything might be ever felt at the local level. And in the meantime, we are seeing families arrive with little kids with sometimes no shoes, just trying to get by. And um, we are working with the governor and trying to support the state and addressing this crisis as it, as it is hitting uh, our state. You described the uh, decision to put folks at the Melnia Cass Rec Center as a painful one. I know folks in my neighborhood, just blocks from my house, are both concerned about it, but also understanding the need for it. It's a mixed reaction. How much, what kind of role did you have in, in the city have in making that decision? Or was that primarily uh, a Governor Healy decision? This is a state building, and we were notified that the, we very much wanted, every city is, is having the same conversations with the state about where there might be some underutilized or vacant space that could be repurposed. We, in some ways, have already been doing this search ourselves for the last two years as we've been primarily addressing mass and cast, but the type of uh, homelessness and uh, that's often connected to substance use that local municipalities are are uniquely responsible for in Boston in this way kind of serves the entire Commonwealth in addressing this crisis and so we had identified every single vacant school building other city building much of it was put to service to address that larger uh, crisis of individual adult homelessness and, and substance use as well we've been seeing some major progress there but when it comes to families the truth is that Boston did not have very much ready to go vacant space with bathrooms and showers and the state looked at their facility. Um, it was the, in some ways an inflection point from my view because this was the first time statewide, as I understand it, that it wasn't just a vacant building that was repurposed for shelter, but a community center and a building that was dedicated for community use. And so this community surrounding it has been incredibly uh, eager to help 
understanding that all of our fates are, are tied in a common sense of struggle. Uh, at the same time, we need to do more to ensure that residents and the programs that were displaced have the supports that they need and that we're also just getting down to the root of what the, the underlying challenge is here, which is not about this group of people or that one, but housing and affordability in general. So Roxbury, Fort Point, a lot of folks might hear your answer and say, is my neighborhood going to be next? Do you have a list of potential neighborhoods and or buildings that you're sort of checking off as you go, okay, if we get full here, this is where we're going to go next? This is a, a statewide conversation, and I know each city is engaging with the state administration in a different way. We have presented many, many locations over the course of the last several months to the state. None have been ideal, which is why we have seen the sites uh, taken up that, that we have. And um, the South Boston, the Seaport site is one owned by a private property owner, so it's actually not even a state or city building in that case. And there's been a call out to faith institutions, to any developers, to those who might be have plans for a property and to use it in the meantime. But um, you know, again, we need to stay also, you can't separate this from the larger mm -hmm. issue that there are residents who've been on, tens of thousands of people have been on the Boston Housing Authority wait list, some of them for years, up to a decade, and we need more housing everywhere. It's not just about Band-Aids for one particular community or one neighborhood or group of people. This is a crisis of housing that we need to have a bigger fix for. Do you have to incentivize those private building owners to take and house migrants, obviously, which gets to the, the problem in Congress because that funding would come from the government. But in order to get space, are you looking at the potential of having to pay these private owners to allow migrants to stay in their facilities? This is a conversation that the state is having. You know, we, at the city level, we run the individual adult uh, how unhoused uh, shelter system. Okay. And so it is much more focused on um, people who are on their own, whether substance use, connected substance use, or folks who had a financial emergency or unexpected medical situation come up and are, are just needing to shelter for a couple weeks. Even within that shelter system that the city runs and we collaborate with partners like Pine Street Inn and other community providers, 25% of those beds are also now um, in service to newly arrived residents from the migrant crisis as well. So we're kind of seeing that impact at all levels. And we need a bigger picture um, fix on the immigration system overall. And then here in this area, we need more housing for everyone. Right. Boston Public School uh, Superintendent Mary Skipper said that she's working to enroll the migrant children into the school system. Do you know how that's going? Yes, we are at um, almost 90 young people who have been enrolled. And um, I've seen the pictures. They, they were connected to schools within walking distance who had empty seats, and so cohorts of students, so they have that support together, have been um, getting to school in a walking bus where everyone kind of holds their hands with their parents and gets to school. Uh, there's, been a, there's been a lot of community support with volunteers and neighbors providing extra clothes for those who might not be prepared for this weather and, and um, other supports for the young people. You know, when you're there, and I've, I've walked every couple of days, I kind of stop by to just check on how things are going. and. The stories of these families are the same as the immigrant stories that my family has, that so many of our communities have, of just wanting to give their kids a better life. And um, we are seeing some little spaces where having city resources like multilingual education, social emotional supports, we've been able to do that in a, a relatively seamless way, thanks to all the hard work of our school system and all the many teams that have been supporting that. All right, let's move to the uh, MBTA. You've been a champion of the idea of a free MBTA. And as mayor, you've made bus service free. Last week, you announced the federal COVID funds were going to be used to keep that bus service free in Mattapan, uh, Roxbury, and Dorchester. Governor Healy, during her State of the Commonwealth address, talked about the idea of a permanent uh, reduced fare for low-income folks. Do you think that approach is perhaps more financially pragmatic, given the T's financial situation, than making it free? I actually see it as all part of the same ecosystem. In my mind, and I think what many of the advocates in our community have been pushing for is the, the most sustainable, immediate, short-term situation that would remove financial barriers in the fastest, most uh, financially feasible way is to have free bus system and then low uh, discounted fare for low-income residents for subway and commuter rail. When you free the bus, it's not only the place where you're already spending, the system is already spending so much to collect fares, it's quite expensive to collect revenues on the bus system, and it also helps with bus liability because 
you know, I've been um, going and have started a series commuting with residents from all different parts of the city just to see what their commutes are like. So I've been on multiple different bus lines in the last couple of weeks. And you notice so much of the wait is when the bus comes, everybody has to line up to get their card out or uncrinkle that, you know, <laughs> find, dollar, find a way yeah. to pay. And on the bus lines that are free, all doors are open, everybody gets on and you start moving. And we've seen shorter wait times for those buses, more ridership, and more reliability as well. All right, let's talk about Walgreens. Another thing that happened in my neighborhood, another Walgreens has closed. This has been the fourth one. I know that you're working with the Urban League and with Lyft to come up with solutions so folks can get to their prescriptions uh, without having to take a, a, a number of a very long walk or a long commute to do that. Um, have you talked to the Walgreens folks? What, what, what's their rationale behind this? And is what more can the city do? What can you do about this? Our teams have been in constant communication with this particular property owner and also with the kind of local and national uh, contact points for Walgreens. I'm also scheduled to sit down with a group of uh, those who are kind of in the pharmacy industry alongside some of our partners at the state, city, state and federal level, because this is a this is a larger issue. We're seeing this happen across the country where communities who have the least alternatives in terms of filling prescriptions and getting medications are seeing these businesses pull out. And so we've been working on, in this site to try to find an alternative that would prioritize, whether it's with a local business or some other use that could ensure we're replacing that for residents. And then in the, the immediate term, Walgreens has agreed to, for example, ship prescriptions for the next 90 days, so they'll deliver it to you for free, mm -hmm. or we are working with local nonprofits to provide a way people can get free transportation to get to that next closest location. Is that free shipping just for the folks impacted by that yes. closure in Roxbury? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, for, for folks who, who see that and, and just wonder, why does this stuff sort of continue to happen in our neighborhoods that are already strapped for resources? When you talk to folks in these neighborhoods, whether it is healthcare or, or, or a rec center that gets used, do you understand their frustration and, and do, you, do you empathize with them um, when they see things sort of, I guess, taken away from them, for lack of better terms? I mean, it's it's a decades long generational sense that the same areas of our city, the same communities are always facing the highest barriers when it comes to just needing to get to your family, having food on the table and access to the health and wellness and happiness that everyone deserves. And so that's why many of our efforts at the city have been very targeted around how do we not only provide the services, but in choosing the right vendors or in designing the contracts? How are we looking for every opportunity, not just to build more housing, but to make sure that the builders are the community residents and from the area so that we're creating wealth and trying to shift these cycles uh, mm. as we go. Uh, before we go to break, I wanna ask you about outdoor dining. It is back. Everybody loves outdoor dining, especially when the weather cooperates. But the North End, again, looking at it and saying, why not us? What is it about the North End that just makes outdoor dining difficult? And is there any way to compromise, perhaps just doing it on the weekends, uh, while understanding just the geography of it does make it a bit of a public safety issue? What is it about that area that just doesn't work for outdoor dining? I mean, the North End is a unique neighborhood statewide. There is no other place where there is as densely concentrated number of restaurants and residents all together. It's 90 restaurants in a one square mile area. Uh, the next closest place, which has some similarities, is Chinatown, where, again, formerly uh, and current immigrant community, lots of restaurants, lots of very busy retail uses and housing and those on top. The difference is, though, that Chinatown has not had, for whatever reason, a history of every single restaurant wanting to do outdoor dining in the street. The sidewalks are too narrow in both neighborhoods as well. And so we've had conversations. I think there are many ways in which we could get creative about this. Um, there are some limitations when uh, there's pending litigation also. And so, um, you know, I hold out hope that at some point in the future we can reach some of those uh, compromises or, or solutions that really work for everyone, but we haven't been able to get all the way in there yet. And um, outdoor dining season has started, so we need to, to get going and we will uh, keep the conversations going in the meantime. Are you willing to look at those compromises while this lit litigation is pending? There's been a, a group that's met and the city's been in, in constant conversation. I mean, the one takeaway is that 
there is appetite across the entire neighborhood to find something that works, but it would need to be a really targeted, unique program for the unique conditions of this neighborhood. All right. We've got to go to break. But speaking of unique programs, the mayor just enrolled a fun program that BPS students can enjoy on Sundays for free at the museums. We're going to speak to her about that and have a bit of a lightning round of questions in just two minutes. Stay with us. Welcome back to At Issue. We are joined by Mayor Michelle Wu this week. Let's go ahead and continue our conversation. All right, your favorite part, the lightning round, which we know <laughs> you love so much. Get a few brief status updates on some proposals of yours. First, is rent control dead? It has been extended for, I believe, something around 30 days in this current phase of uh, the legislative process. Do you think the governor's ever going to get on board with that? The governor has expressed some support for municipalities to do their thing, and we have put together a very reasonable proposal for the city of Boston that would stem the most egregious rent increases, and we need support on stopping displacement. The barriers to renting, the finder's fee, the rental fee, all those things that cost thousands of dollars, is there anything the city can do to help decrease that challenge? I know the city council is looking at several proposals this year, and every possible dollar that we've squeezed out from federal recovery funds have gone to trying to make housing more affordable, creating more of it, finding ways to smooth and, and simplify the process so people can get into affordable units faster, and also just to identify places where in rezoning the city or thinking about existing city buildings like libraries that need to be renovated, we could add affordable housing on top. So we are trying to do everything we can to make sure that on the supply side there's more, and then when, when it is affordable, people can get in faster. How, how are things going on that, this conversion of commercial buildings, unused office space into, into housing? Has, has any renovations anywhere started? We are uh, approaching a potentially construction starting even this spring okay. for at least one of the projects. There are about almost 200 units now that could be created from some of the proposals that have been put forward to convert vacant or, or underutilized office buildings downtown into residential. Right. It's a win-win all around. We need more foot traffic to support the small businesses. It keeps the community vibrant and safe and exciting. And um, it's just also a time when there's much less demand for downtown office building given new ways of working and much more virtual okay. or hybrid work. Uh, congratulations, you've made it past the midpoint of your mayoral term. <laughs> Are you going to run for re-election? I have a lot on my plate that I'm loving every single day. Mm -hmm. We have lots of long-term projects that I hope to work on for a long time. Um, so I hope there will be time for political announcements, you know, at some point in the future. But right now we're focused on the work in front of us. Do you have a timeline on that? Like we can ask you again when? <laughs> I'm sure no matter what I say, you're not going to listen to Good it. Good point. All right, let's talk about liquor licenses. Uh, you want, the mayor wants, the mayor of Boston wants the power to issue liquor licenses. Governor Healy seemed like she was going to do it and grant it and then she isn't. I could go on for 3,000 hours mm -hmm. about why you don't have the power for liquor licenses and why the state lawmakers do. But do you? what's going on here? Do you think that mayors should have the power to issue liquor licenses in their city? The current system is broken. Right? We have a capped system that cities cannot, or at least in Boston, we cannot easily shift without going through many months of process and not even knowing if, if we can get through it. Um, and what that what the result is is a concentration of liquor licenses in parts of the city where they can generate the most profit. And then in many of our neighborhoods, for example, Mattapan, for example, uh, parts of Dorchester and, and Hyde Park, there there's just a, a lack of sit down restaurants or communal spaces because of the liquor license disparity issue. There is a proposal up at the state house specifically for Boston that I know our legislators are considering and have been in. Uh, close coordination with city councilors and our office on this would be a, a mechanism in the short term to create ways for neighborhood targeted licenses that would just add and provide some of the relief that we need for entrepreneurs to get going. All right, so you made it through the lightning round. So <laughs> from now on, feel free to speak <laughs> at length. Um, I want to talk about zoning. Why is squares and streets the best approach to updating the antiquated Boston zoning code? And how do you get neighborhoods and developers on board? Whenever people ask what is the most, the least talked about but most important issue that affects everything, I always say it's the zoning code. Ask anyone on the street, no one's thinking about the zoning code. It's wonky, it's 
hundreds of pages, it's incredibly dense, but it ends up being the rules that decide almost everything else about how our neighborhoods look. Where can we put what kinds of buildings? How tall can they be? How easily can we build them? And Boston zoning code hasn't been comprehensively updated collectively since 1965. So it's very outdated, and that means that almost every decision that's made, every building that's built, goes through some exception to the rules through the Zoning Board of Appeals or through the BPDA. So we are trying to modernize that system and move away from an old um, kind of neighborhood-based system that was too broad and too specific in some ways. It was taking years and years to talk about one neighborhood at a time, but not getting to the level of specificity. And then by the time you got around to the next neighborhood, it was out of date already. And so we're taking a very targeted approach under Chief of Planning Arthur Jemison and his team, going one neighborhood Main Street's corridor at a time, a very targeted bite-sized look, block by block with residents about what they want to see. More housing on top of small businesses that also bring more customers. These are transit hubs and areas that already have a lot of access. And so everything's on the table. What does your neighborhood need and how can we actually write that into the rules so we're making it more predictable and it will actually connect with the vision and dreams and um, reality of, of what our neighborhoods need. Last week, uh, residents of Charlestown sued to stop the, your administration's plan to turn a hotel into affordable housing. The city has the power of eminent domain. Is that something you would envision using to get more housing for people? Eminent domain is quite an extreme measure. And in fact, we have a proposal up at the state house that would end the urban renewal powers that were uh, basically the legal mechanism through which the West End got completely bulldozed mm -hmm. and tens of thousands of families were displaced. So rather than leaning into the kind of heavy-handed, extraordinary um, measures of the past that, that just push community to the side, we want to work with community there, whether it's this proposal or others, mm -hmm. we want to build that into the process. So we're planning ahead of time with residents for the housing that we need, the affordability, and that includes everyone, including the um, housing that's needed for formerly uh, for residents who are formerly unhoused or those who need extra support in housing as well. Uh, I was talking to my barber about you the other day because he took his kids. You look very sharp. Thank you. <laughs> he took, good job. <laughs> he took his kids to the museum, and he talked about how this program of, of, of making it free on Sundays is great for a family like his because everybody can go. But we know that the pushback to this program of making museums, some museums free the two first Sundays of the month, does leave out some kids and some families. I know it's a seven month pilot program. Do you envision expanding it to kids who maybe go to public charter schools or private schools in the Boston area to allow them and their families to enjoy this, this amenity that you uh, have started? I absolutely believe that arts and culture and the world-class institutions we have in Boston should be treated like public infrastructure for everyone. It is necessary for every young person to go be in places that spark their imagination or to see the creatures and animals at the zoo and the aquarium, to get to get their hands dirty with all the experiments at the Museum of Science. And so I'm so thankful to these six institutions, the MFA, the ICA, Children's Museum, Museum of Science, the aquarium, and the zoo for partnering with us. Today is, in fact, a BPS Sunday, and so these six institutions are free for BPS students and three of their family members. We saw last week huge uptake, 900-plus uh, family members at the aquarium and many, many more across the other institutions. It changes how people feel about their city and who belongs. Of course, we want that to extend to everyone, and we're studying very carefully how p families are finding out where they're going. Are they going just to one place that they love? Are they really trying all of them? Once we learn more about all of that, then the hope is that we can really um, take this further and make it a permanent program. All right, all right. Michelle. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks we for appreciate it. We'll see, we'll see you back soon for that uh, potential announcement yeah. of whether they're going to run for re-election. If you want to do that here, by all means, we'll have you in. So thank you for joining nice us. Nice to see you both. All right, uh, another reminder before we go, you can always uh, listen to the continued conversations that we have here on At Issue with our podcast, Taking Issue. We drop a new episode every single week. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much again for joining us here on At Issue, but we are back next Sunday. We have Massachusetts Republican Party Chair Amy Carnevale. She's going to join us to talk about her plans to help rebuild the party here in the Bay State. Thank you so much for joining us on this Sunday. I'm Corey Smith. And I'm Sue O'Connell. Have a great Sunday.